Godzilla Minus One is a film that has done the impossible. The movie was released in Japan to enormous critical praise and was followed with glowing audience reviews. Upon its international release, the film proved to be a juggernaut and was received with open arms worldwide. Recently, in addition to breaking numerous US records for foreign film releases, Godzilla Minus One passed a landmark many of us thought was impossible. The film outperformed 2016's Shin Godzilla at the global box office with an enormous boost from markets outside of Japan. When Shin Godzilla was released, it received endless praise and was hailed by many fans as this generation's defining Godzilla movie. The film's cultural impact was enormous, with Toho making Shin Godzilla their new flagship design, featuring him in theme parks, arcade games, in collaboration advertisements, in all forms of merchandise, and as their mascot. The 2016 design was featured on Toho's anniversary logos, and as their main attraction in the 2016 to 2017 New Year's celebration. Hideaki Anno and Shinji Higuchi's Godzilla design was inescapable. The studio behind the Godzilla films even went as far as to commission a full-scale Shin Godzilla head sticking out of the ground at Awaji Island that functions as a zipline and game attraction. The iconic statue at the heart of what is known as the Hibiya Godzilla Square made in tribute of Godzilla's death in 1995's Godzilla vs. Destroyo was replaced with an updated Shin Godzilla in 2018. The 90s interpretation of Godzilla had been Toho's frontrunner since it first came on the scene, appearing in countless cross-promotions, public appearances, and merchandise items. This was Toho's definitive Godzilla, and within one movie, Shin Godzilla was able to skyrocket in popularity and replace him, at least for a while. The popularity of Shin Godzilla was fueled by three primary factors. The film's creative head and primary director was Hideaki Anno, the man responsible for the Evangelion franchise. Anno has had an enormous and dedicated following both in Japan and amongst anime fans worldwide. Having such a popular creator at the center of this picture boosted the film's mainstream popularity. The film was also released at a fantastic time. Shin Godzilla was the first Japanese Godzilla movie since 2004's Godzilla Final Wars, and was partly advertised as the first Godzilla film in 12 years, despite the release of 2014's Godzilla just two years prior. The movie also touched upon recent issues, dealing heavily with the political and social fallout of the March 11, 2011 triple disaster, which shook Japan to their core. The combined earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima power plant meltdown provided the framework for an incredibly timely and gripping political satire that spoke to the concerns of the Japanese people on a deeper level. The final factor that helped Shin Godzilla was that it was a really well-made movie, with inventive cinematography, a polish the likes of which the Japanese Godzilla films had never come close to before, and an inventive editing style and soundscape that brought viewers into this world in ways that were thrilling and unexplored for the time. Because such a perfect storm surrounded the release of Shin Godzilla, and as a result of the film's enormous cultural impact, it seemed unlikely that success would be repeated, despite the Godzilla franchise being back in a big way in Japan. Over the course of the Heisei series of Godzilla films, audiences were treated to nearly one Godzilla movie a year, starting in 1989 and ending in 1995. While successful, these films were released in such close relation to one another that they slowly had diminishing returns. Toho's planned retirement for the Japanese Godzilla didn't last long, as the monster stormed back into theaters just four years and one US reboot later, and again, the Japanese movie going public was treated to one Godzilla movie a year all the way through 2004. While Godzilla Final Wars was intended to be the grand finale for the Millennium series already, the modest box office performance and overall slow downward trend of the franchise ensured that Godzilla's rest would last longer this time than it had between the Heisei and Millennium series. The long and painful drought many Godzilla fans still speak of to this day came to an end after 10 years of waiting, as Legendary released their first entry of the MonsterVerse with Godzilla 2014. Godzilla had a meteoric rise in popularity, going from a niche selection of genre films that weren't widely remembered outside of Japan, aside from a few of the sillier entries that played extremely well in syndication in the United States, to a franchise at the forefront of culture alongside the MCU, Transformers, Hunger Games, Spider-Man, and the X-Men. Over the past decade, the MonsterVerse has propelled Godzilla to new heights, previously unattainable for the franchise as a global staple. The film series was valued at over $2 billion as of 2021 and has made Godzilla more of a worldwide phenomenon than ever before. While the MonsterVerse films are more commercially successful than the Japanese Godzilla films, they often aren't as creatively praised as Shin Godzilla was, even though they're benefited by the fact that they are massive Hollywood productions that can afford wide-scale global releases with enormous ad campaigns to support them. These luxuries are not afforded to the Japanese films, making their accomplishments even more impressive. When the first trailer for Godzilla 2014 was released to the public in December of 2013, it lit the internet ablaze. The trailer single-handedly resurrected interest in the Godzilla franchise and brought the films back into the 
public consciousness on a scale that had not been seen since 1998's Godzilla. The film worked incredibly hard to rehabilitate Godzilla's public perception from where the US audiences had last seen the franchise in the late 90s. It attempted to redeem American filmmakers in the eyes of Godzilla fans, and tried hard to honor Toho's attempts to revitalize the series from a collection of children's films to a serious and grounded franchise. The 2014 film had an amazing advertising campaign that made the filmmaker's intentions clear from the first seconds of the initial trailer. The discussion surrounding the film's release was built around mystery and intrigue, with lots of talk of this being a potential remake or update to the original 1954 film. Misquotes about Godzilla's new design being the real Godzilla that Toho filmmakers would have looked at and then based their suits on were used as fuel for these fires. The trailer's apocalyptic tone and implication that Godzilla was a creature out for revenge against humanity, reborn from the atomic bomb as the destroyer of worlds, contributed to a general atmosphere in which the public was excited about the potential to see a new solo Godzilla story that took the franchise back to its dark roots. While there were hints that other monsters were slated to appear in Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, audiences really needed to be in the know to know this information. It wasn't until closer to the film's release that teases of an upcoming monster battle became more obvious, and people started to become aware of what the film really was. Upon the movie's release, Godzilla had a positive reception, with mixed to good reviews. Critics were fairly satisfied with the film, while many fans and members of the public were disappointed in it for many reasons. One of the main contributing factors to audiences' mixed feelings was that the movie wasn't the same movie that had been advertised. The film was serious, but it wasn't apocalyptic. It was grounded in the human perspective, but not in the characters that audiences had been hoping for, and the film was a Godzilla origin story, but wasn't THE Godzilla origin story audiences had been expecting. Rather than focusing on the titular character, the movie focuses on his opponents, the all-but-marketed bug-like creatures, the Mutos. Either way, the MonsterVerse was off and running, with a great start. However, there was a certain hunger that was left unsatisfied by this film. Many audiences were still wanting the dark and gritty return to Godzilla's roots with a solo story that harkened back to the original. Their prayers were answered with 2016's Shin Godzilla. Many fans agree that every generation needs a definitive Godzilla film, a true classic solo Godzilla story that throws back to Godzilla's roots and redefines what Godzilla was meant to be for the new generation. Obviously, this starts with the 1954 classic that laid the stage for all the films to come since. Over the course of the Showa series, Toho was forced to follow trends in television and gear the franchise towards younger children. While this was the right call for the struggling studio and the franchise, and proved that Godzilla is one of the most malleable characters in film history, it also diluted the brand and led to later entries in the series struggling to churn a profit. Toho put all the films on hiatus for nearly a decade, only to reboot with the direct sequel to the original. 1984's Godzilla was tonally in line with the original Godzilla movie and was Toho's first attempt to alter the public perception of Godzilla from a silly children's icon to a serious movie character who starred in artistic and intellectual films that still maintained a sense of fun and excitement. The 1984 film returns the franchise to its deeply political roots and evolves the discussion from an overall criticism of the nuclear bomb and on Japan post-World War II to a global commentary on the Cold War and the way that the United States and Russia's actions impact Japan as well as each other. Godzilla is restored to his status as a tragic and horrifying embodiment of the nuclear bomb come to life and has been stripped of his heroic personality and his crazy power set established through the original sequels. Godzilla 1984 was a critical and commercial success in Japan, performing well at the box office and receiving positive reviews, with lots of praise regarding Godzilla's menacing characterization. Toho had successfully reminded the public for the first time since the early Showa series of what Godzilla was meant to be. The Showa series for Godzilla pushed the character through impressive boundaries, moving him from a serious and gritty symbol of nuclear devastation to a strange and misunderstood anti-hero, then transforming him into a strict father who must learn compassion before fully realizing him as the king of the monsters. In the later Showa films, Godzilla became a superhero, a partner in crime, a friend to children, and even an inspiration for young boys to grow braver. The Showa films pushed Godzilla to his extreme limits, and somehow, people still accepted the changes made and embraced what Godzilla could be. All the while, Toho and many of the filmmakers involved never let go of what Godzilla was meant to be deep down. A similar arc occurred for Godzilla during the Heisei films, as Godzilla received a complex and nuanced update to his characterization. By the time the final films had rolled around, Godzilla had moved from being an emotionless, destructive force of nature to being a sorrowful and misunderstood protector of a child who would often defend the Earth against an evil kaiju, not because it was the right thing to do for the planet, but because it was the best thing to do for himself and eventually his child. This gave way to the Millennium series, which attempted a balancing act between Godzilla's original intent 
intentions and his full Showa series potential. The film succeeded at varying results depending on the entry, but things became extreme by the end. Toho's attempt to counterbalance their new flexible Godzilla series was GMK, a film that maintained the monster-on-monster -monster action popularized in the Showa series, but also took Godzilla back to his dark and gritty roots. The result is a film that has gone on to become one of the all-time fan favorites in the franchise, and is the one that is the most fondly remembered from the Millennium series. While it wasn't a solo Godzilla film, it had the heart of those stories and the excitement of the Versus movies. However, in a sea of other anthology entries, its cultural impact wasn't as large as it maybe should have been. This brings us to the modern age. The Legendary series decided to deliver on the far more marketable aspects of Godzilla, paying subtle tribute to Godzilla's origins while leaning into Godzilla's more iconic Western perception as a hero and as the star of outlandish sequels. The MonsterVerse films fast-tracked their way through the Showa series by taking Godzilla from a serious force of nature to a main player in wide-scale adventure epics full of energy and humor. In many ways, the MonsterVerse is doubling down on what Godzilla can be and attempting to prove that the franchise still has the range to reach those extremes. On the other end, Toho has tried to expand their boundaries in different directions by keeping the core characterization and tone of Godzilla intact, but exploring new plot lines, genres, and styles of filmmaking. This is where Shin Godzilla came into the picture. In many ways, the film was a live-action anime and felt more stylistically in line with many episodes of Evangelion than it did with the Godzilla franchise. While the film was a serious and grounded return to Godzilla solo films, the movie made the decision to update its themes and message to fit the modern era. Godzilla was updated, no longer a symbol of the atomic bomb, he was now a symbol of Japan's triple threat that culminated in a nuclear disaster. That was just one of the many elements of this new version of the character. Shin Godzilla is an amazing movie that uses familiar elements of Godzilla and then takes them in brand new directions. Godzilla's design has the silhouette of the classic kaiju, but upon further analysis, looks wildly different. Godzilla's origins and power set are more extreme than they have ever been before. In many ways, Shin Godzilla is the ultimate culmination of the idea that Godzilla can be stretched to extremes. The film is so different and takes so many risks that it only bears a vague resemblance to the original intent for the character in the first place. While the movie retains a similar anti-nuclear message to the original movie, the film's core values have shifted. Rather than worrying about how nuclear weapons impact the broader world, the film is worried about how the Japanese government will respond to global threats and how those decisions will affect their people. Shin Godzilla is a strange film, both in story and execution, but it was a risk worth taking because it wound up being a fantastic representation of how Godzilla can be updated for the modern age. Finally, we arrive back at Godzilla Minus One. Director Takashi Yamazaki stated during Toho's announcement press conference for the movie that he was originally inspired by the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, much like Hideaki Yano, but because of Shin Godzilla's success, he didn't want to retread any of the same material. Instead, Yamazaki decided to explore the previously uncharted territories of the direct aftermath of World War II, touching upon all the themes of the original film in a more direct way than they were allowed to do back then. Godzilla Minus One is a film that pulls from all aspects of the Godzilla franchise, borrowing both the best of what Godzilla can be and what Godzilla was meant to be to create a nice blend that pays tribute to the entire franchise's history. During the development of Godzilla Minus One, I had personally heard from people close to production that while Toho is satisfied and excited by the United States films, they feel that the movies undersatisfy on capturing all aspects of Godzilla's character. As a result, they decided to make a movie that acts as a counterweight to those films. Godzilla Minus One takes us back to the original intentions of the Godzilla franchise, both stylistically and intellectually. The film returns Godzilla to a post-war state and builds upon the anti-nuclear themes of the original. The film brings forth the ultimate portrayal as Godzilla as a destroyer and utilizes his ferocity to deepen the audience's understanding of the film's themes and core message about personal trauma and nuclear annihilation. While the Toho Godzilla films don't have the budget of the US movies, Takashi Yamazaki's incredible team at Shirogami is talented enough to pull off near Hollywood quality special effects sequences that can thrill audiences just as well as the US films. Godzilla Minus One finally scratched the itch left 10 years ago by the first trailer for Godzilla 2014 by delivering on a serious, grounded, apocalyptic, realistic portrayal of Godzilla as a solo destroyer out to get vengeance against mankind. The movie's interpretation of Godzilla is grounded in the roots of the original film, taking inspiration from his successors, but never diverging as far as those sequels. Lots of Godzilla fans have praised Shin Godzilla as being this generation's solo Godzilla story, but the film doesn't act as a return to form as much as it does a bold step in a new direction. If Shin Godzilla was someone's first introduction to the character, then they have a hyper-specific portrait of what Godzilla is painted in their mind that doesn't reflect the entire franchise. That's what Minus 
Minus One does so well. Godzilla Minus One delivers on a Godzilla who looks, feels, and acts like Godzilla. The film uses emotional beats, music cues, and familiar iconography to the original films to its benefit to help flesh out Godzilla's mythos while serving the story being told. Minus One does what Shin Godzilla chose not to. It sticks to the formula. For the most direct time since 1956, global audiences are being introduced to what Godzilla was meant to be and its landing with viewers in a huge way. Audiences are now embracing the serious, dramatic, artistic side of Godzilla in ways that they couldn't with a film like Shin Godzilla, which weaponized its sillier moments against the viewers in order to keep them on their toes. They're connecting with the roots of Godzilla in ways that the MonsterVerse has chosen to neglect. Audiences are now realizing that Godzilla doesn't have to be a superhero at the star of Versus movies. He can be something much deeper. Godzilla Minus One was released at a perfect time. To celebrate Godzilla's 70th anniversary, Toho took Godzilla back to his roots and delivered on a film that went against the modern grain in almost every way by sticking to a decades-old formula. It's hard for modern audiences to want to go back to watch a 70-year-old black-and-white monster movie. While Godzilla 1984 was a grand update to the franchise's original intentions 30 years after the release of the original, the film is still very dated by modern standards. With the MonsterVerse deciding to head in the direction of Godzilla's potential as a character outside of the original film, the best audiences had in the way of a classic update was Shin Godzilla, which is a fantastic film, but strays too far away from the origins of Godzilla to feel like THE definitive update on the premise. This led to Godzilla Minus One, a film that chose to focus on modernization rather than innovation, and has been praised as a result. Godzilla Minus One is the perfect Godzilla movie for right now because it does the same thing that Toho needed to do to create the definitive update to Godzilla's story in 1984. It represents the current peak of the Japanese filmmaking landscape, taking Godzilla back to his roots and updating the story and characters to have themes both relevant to the 1954 film and to modern audiences. And most of all, as the MonsterVerse films attempt to see how far Godzilla can go, Godzilla Minus One anchors the franchise in the past as a counterstatement to that, coexisting with it, and proving the time old adage that Toho has an order, a power to restore balance. I believe Godzilla Minus One is that power. Thank you guys so much for watching, I really appreciate it. Thank you for sticking with the video this long, that means a lot to me. This video is kind of made in response to a friend of mine. I saw Godzilla Minus One in Japan at the same time as a friend who saw the movie, and he said that he just didn't think there was a need for another solo Godzilla movie so close to Shin Godzilla, and I kind of disagreed. So I wanted to make a video that kind of gives my perspective on it, how Shin Godzilla I think is a fantastic movie that doesn't serve as the definitive Godzilla movie for this generation. This video is also somewhat of a follow-up to my review for Godzilla Minus One, in which I talk at length about how I felt that Godzilla Minus One was the perfect Godzilla movie for right now, and how I felt like it is the definitive Godzilla movie for this generation and will change the way we view Godzilla moving forward. Go check that video out, it's a good one. I really hate when people say that Minus One is what Godzilla should be. I tried very hard to avoid using that kind of terminology. I think that there is a difference between what Godzilla was meant to be and what Godzilla can be. I see a lot of people talking about what Godzilla is versus what he should be, and I don't think that's a discussion that makes any sense. Godzilla can be anything, and he shouldn't be one thing in particular. He shouldn't be tied down to just one thing, otherwise it'll get stale. So I wanted to make this video to get my perspective on the whole thing, but where do you stand on that? Where are you on the balance of what Godzilla was meant to be versus what he can be? Alright, thank you guys so much for watching. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to support the Patreon, you can use the link in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for the next one. D-Man, out.